This land was made for war. As glass resists the bite of vitriol, so this hard and calcined earth rejects the battle's hot corrosive impact. Here is no nubile, girlish land. No green and virginal countryside for war to violate. This land is hard, inviolable. Benito Mussolini declares war on France and Britain. Combattenti di terra, di mare, dell'aria. Popolo italiano, corri alle armi e dimostra la tua tenacia, il tuo coraggio. Like some latter-day Roman consul, Mussolini longed for an African empire. Already he had massacred the Abyssinians and subjugated the Libyans. Now he wanted more. We were certainly not ready to go to war in 1940. It was purely a political move of Mussolini, who felt that Hitler was winning too much too quickly and that if he didn't sort of make some sort of gesture, take some sort of initiative, he would not be able to sit at the conference table. Mussolini's eyes were on Egypt. The Egypt of the Nile and the Suez Canal. In autumn 1940, he poured a quarter of a million troops into Egypt's neighbor, Libya, and another 300,000 into Ethiopia. Facing them in Egypt were just 30,000 British soldiers of the Western Desert Force. <laughs> September the 13th, 1940, when the battle for Britain was at its height, Mussolini's men set out to conquer Egypt. Completely outnumbered, the British troops simply fell back. After four days, Mussolini's men were to reach Sidi Barani, 60 miles inside Egypt. There they would stop, still 300 miles short of Cairo. Looking back now, it seems an extraordinary thing how we moved into Egypt by sending out these enormous columns, not very well protected because we didn't have any tanks, and then each one of them settling down in a sort of fortified camp. This helped, of course, General O'Connor, I think, a lot. 
General O'Connor, the British commander, had used the pause to plan a counterattack. The Italians had a series of these uh, fortified perimeter camps, and we decided that as they were so far apart, they would be unable to support each other, and we moved our troops round to attack them from the rear, the way that their rations would come. O'Connor undertook an operation which was due to last about four days, which was the limit for the available tanks, which were nearly worn out, and for our administration in terms of supplying water and fuel and ammunition. He achieved complete surprise, got behind the Italian positions at Sidi Barani, and in the morning, the Italian resistance collapsed. Connor's great achievement was that by using captured vehicles and captured dumps of water and fuel, he was able to maintain this four-day battle into what became an offensive lasting over a period of weeks and resulted in taking him as far as Benghazi and indeed beyond to El Aguila. An area the size of England and France had been captured. For the British, it was an unbelievable victory and marvellously opportune. For back home, the Blitz was mounting in ferocity. For Mussolini, a mere six months after entering the war, the defeat meant the pricking of his imperial pretensions. Mussolini had said, I want 1,000 Italian dead to be able to sit at the conference table. And of course, it cost many more than that. Two hundred thousand Italians were taken prisoner. Well, they'd had enough. In many cases, they were very, very happy to surrender. To think that we were vastly outnumbered, and to see one Tommy taking literally thousands back to the POW cage was a great joy for us to see. We used to call them gentlemen. There go the gentlemen. Tripoli, Libya's capital, was in O'Connor's grasp. But Churchill withdrew the cream of O'Connor's forces to meet the Nazi threat in Greece. We couldn't do Greece and Tripoli at the same time. That's quite clear. I say we could have done Tripoli immediately and still left the options open for Greece. We lost an enormous opportunity to finish up North Africa, and it was a fatal error to have gone to Greece. If we had advanced immediately, we could have pushed him out. I entirely blame myself for not having done it. I think it was quite inexcusable. I ought to have. February the 12th, 1941, Hitler comes to Mussolini's rescue. A small mobile force that had been hurriedly put together set sail to Tripoli. The force that was soon to be renowned as the Africa Corps. The task of the German Africa Army was only to tie down as many British troops as possible and to cover the southern flank of Europe. We had never the intention to conquer Egypt or to cross the Suez Canal. The man Hitler chose to save Mussolini from further disaster had made his name in France the summer before. Erwin Rommel. In 
the port of Tripolis in February, March 41, Rommel told my friend, Lieutenant Hund, an engineer, Hund, here you can build me 150 tanks. The man looked stupefied and Rommel told him, don't you have timber here in the harbor and canvas of sails to make 150 covers for Volkswagen? So you can give me 150 tanks. And those tanks misled the British. Rommel, as yet, knew nothing about desert warfare. But he was bold and daring. Rommel was uh, perhaps the ideal commander for this war theater. It was very wide in area, but uh, very limited in uh, numbers of soldiers, and so he could apply practically naval tactics. Towns and cities were very few, and therefore we've had no difficulties with the Arabian population. They didn't disturb us. The very same evening, the Africa Corps arrived they were ordered to the front. Rommel believed in attack and quickly. Ah! On the last day of March, when not all the troops promised him had even landed in Africa, he took on the British at El Aguila and in just 12 days pushed them back the 500 miles to Egypt. It was as if the bogeyman was just round the corner. It was, here comes Rommel, or Rommel's coming down the desert fast. Get the hell out of it. Now it was the British turn to be taken prisoner in their thousands. Rommel told me to go ahead and we reached Derna, picking up on our way English soldiers and generals who came in one by one. Amongst them, the famous General O'Connor. It was miles behind our own front. We drove into the one bit of the desert in which the Germans had sent a reconnaissance group. It was a great shock, and I never thought it could ever happen to me. Very conceited, perhaps. And so the Rommel legend took shape. By mid-April, he had driven the British back where they had started. But one pinprick remained, to Brook. A hundred miles behind the front, its Australian garrison held out, denying Rommel a precious forward port for his supplies. As long as Tobruk remained in British hands, it threatened Rommel's supply lines and deterred him from advancing any further into Egypt. Unable to take Tobruk by direct assault, Rommel prepared to besiege it. The Luftwaffe too were called in. Over a thousand raids were mounted against a brook. Right under Rommel's nose, the Royal Navy replaced the Tobruk garrison with fresh troops, Poles, South Africans, Indians, British. It was bare rations in Tobruk, although one must thank the Navy, and they did a wonderful job. In 1941, the Royal Navy ruled the Mediterranean. They had done so since giving the powerful Italian fleet a bloody nose at Taranto the previous autumn. And so the British convoys could make their way through the Mediterranean relatively unmolested. More importantly, operating from Malta, the Royal Navy could harass Rommel's own convoys passing from Italy to Tripoli.
British supplies got through, while Rommel's didn't. Denied the petrol necessary for his panzers, Rommel couldn't advance any further into Egypt that summer. And worse, no matter how hard he tried, Rommel couldn't take Tobruk. It remained a thorn in his side and became too a symbol of British doggedness every bit as much as Churchill's bulldog face. We were pestered with blaring loudspeakers on the perimeter. We were called the self-imposed prisoners of Tobruk. Rommel's propaganda machine bellowed at us to give up. Well, we just took no notice. We said, we'll uh, stick it out. We knew that they couldn't get in. There had been no light at the end of the tunnel at all since the withdrawal from Dunkirk. I think for political and above all for morale reasons, the morale of the people of this country. It was terribly important to show that we could help the Germans. The desert war for the moment was in stalemate, a time for taking stock of tactics as well as supplies. Rommel's tactics were more effective than those of the British, especially in his use of tanks. We had been trained to fire on the move, to execute the sort of cavalry charge on tracks and handle armor in that way. The Germans had studied this problem much more than we between the wars. And also, of course, Rommel had experience from north, northern France, and so had many of his tank crews. And they appreciated that the tank's best action against his enemy is to wait for him to come on, sitting in a hull-hidden position, if they're caught in the open to decoy the enemy onto their own anti-tank gun lines. Rommel's main anti-tank weapon was the Krupp-made 88mm. It had decimated the French tanks in May 1940 and was doing the same now to the British tanks. It was effective at 1,000 yards and over. They could pinpoint you, zero into you, and it brew a tank up easily. They could shoot at us before we could even get within striking distance. We couldn't hope to hit them with the two-pounders or the six-pounders. Rommel not only had the edge on the British in tactics and equipment, he also enjoyed the confidence of his political chief, Hitler. Wavell, his opposite number, was continually being pressured by Churchill to provide a victory. When he didn't, he was replaced by General Sir Claude Auchinleck. The Auk, in turn, appointed as his commander in the field, Lieutenant General Cunningham, Cunningham had defeated the Italians in East Africa and put back Haile Selassie on the throne of Abyssinia. But he was an infantryman and knew nothing about tanks. The tank held the key to success in the desert, but British tanks left much to be desired. They were very poor, uh, mechanically. There was parts missing, parts not connected properly. Unlike the Germans, the British had few tank transporters so their tanks had to move long distances as well as fight on their tracks. Every track is connected to the next track by a pin, a lot of moving parts, which in the desert was sometimes powdery, but hard, gritty sand. Well, water is a lubricant, and the tank track is best suited to muddy conditions. To Churchill, the desert war had been too long in still. He needed victory, especially after the humiliating failures in Greece and Crete. No sooner were Cunningham and Auchinleck appointed than they too were pressured into an offensive. The British now had more equipment, but their tactics hadn't changed. Rommel might well have been tempted to echo Wellington's words, they came on in the same old way and we stopped them in the same old way. In just five days that November, Cunningham lost 300 tanks 
two-thirds of his force, many through mechanical failure. Set your track came off and jammed. Well, if you were in action, you couldn't do anything about it but bail out. And then you couldn't recover the tank. At that time in the desert, we had no means of recovery of tanks. You'd always leave the battleground. Jerry's, they used to seem to stay there. We might have had a successful day, but Jerry's always seemed to deny us the battlefield. Their equipment had to come equally as far as ours, but they seemed to value it more and did every effort to recover their tanks as soon as it got dusk. By bluff and guile, Rommel convinced Cunningham he had lost the battle. But Orkinlek was determined to stay put. He sacked Cunningham, who wanted to withdraw, and appointed Ritchie. The gamble to stay and fight came off. When defeat stared the British in the face, the battle's balance swung dramatically their way as Rommel's panzers ran out of fuel. Tobruk was relieved. Rommel was forced to withdraw the 500 miles back to his starting point, and on Christmas Eve 1941, Benghazi changed hands for the third time. But with Commonwealth forces again poised to push the Axis out of Africa, they were once more denuded of troops and equipment, this time for the Far East, where Japan's entry into the war threatened British bases in Burma and Malaya. An opportunity of gaining uh, something which was real and important in the, in the Middle Eastern theatre uh, was lost for the sake of uh, something which was very doubtful and uh, unlikely to pay off in the Far East. Within a couple of weeks, Rommel counterattacked. Against the weakened British forces, he recaptured Benghazi and once more threatened to brook. He was stopped at Ghazala. Once again, it was stalemate. The peculiar conditions of the desert bred a comradeship that was unique in the whole war. To many, the desert war was a private war, the last to retain any pretense of chivalry. As soon as we stopped anywhere and there was a lull and a rest, he'd clear off a patch of the desert and say, right now we'll have a game of football. The sportsmanship showed at both sides football games were not interrupted by artillery fire during certain periods. The staple diet was biscuits and bully beef. We had bully beef fried, bully beef boiled, bully beef with dog biscuits. Oh, and dog biscuits. Dogs would eat, and dogs would well, refuse to eat them. With food a problem and fresh water scarce, dysentery was a constant danger. The Germans invented a water can, which the envious English, after seeing theirs burst countless times on the bumpy desert surfaces, copied and christened the jerry can. We were rationed at one stage there on a cup of water a day to bath, shave. What often happened was the sections collected their ration, put it into a helmet, and each one shaved out of that. Above all, it was hot. Very, very, very hot. It was so hot you could fry an egg on the mud guard of a wall. It's literally true, you could break an egg on the outside. It was so hot it would sizzle. The fly was perhaps the desert soldier's greatest scourge. Not just as a nuisance, but as a carrier of disease. Flies were indifferent, of course, as to which side they played. At one stage there, there were competitions as to who killed the most flies. The flies were that fattened with living on the dead 
that uh, every time you kill them, the smell got into you and caused stomach upsets. And we had orders from division headquarters to cut out this business of killing the flies. We just had to let them go. I think one fly has, within one year, nine million children. There was, too, the occasional scorpion and viper. And when the wind blew, the sand and dust got in everywhere. The fine dust used to clog up everything. The jets would clot up in the carburetors. Your watches would stop. It created problems with our intestines. It gives a form of diarrhea, which is very severe because of this sand passing through. You had, for instance, to go from your quarters to the latrine. And you had literally to do it with a march compass. There are cases where soldiers did not return when they had forgotten their march compass. In the sandstorm, of course, the fighting stopped, which was enjoyed at the beginning. Mm, after three days, you think uh, the better the sandstorm stops and the fighting starts again. Ritchie planned an offensive for the end of May with his new Grant tanks from America. But Rommel, as usual, got in first. Ritchie had learned little from previous mistakes. Like the Italians, he had set up a series of fortified camps and laid mines galore. But just as a Conrad had done with the Italians, Rommel simply went round the open flank. We were down south, just in front of Beer Came, and during the morning, we'd seen this dust going up where Jerry was. He was coming through where the South Armour Div were. And it was like a fox in a hen coop. Everybody dashed and battled all over the place. Rich's new tanks were proving a disappointment. Once again, the British armor was outmaneuvered. The Battle of Gazala was Rommel's. The way was now open to the prize that had eluded Rommel the previous summer, the prize that Churchill for one had determined ever to deny him, to Brooke. Tobruk's fortifications had been neglected. They were no longer as formidable as they had been the previous summer. Juni. Das Oberkommando der Wehrmacht gibt bekannt. Berlin Radio broadcast the news of Tobruk's surrender. For Churchill, it was a particularly dark moment. For Rommel, the peak of his career and a grateful Führer made him field marshal. Festung Tobruk. The British now fell back into Egypt further than ever before. I've never seen such chaos. It looked, you'd never be able to save a situation. I've never seen that desert road crammed with every sort of vehicle, every unit muddled up, hickledy pickledy. No one knew what was going on. And um, luckily, our Air Force was stronger than the enemies at that time, otherwise, I think we'd be routed. The state of despair had to be masked. And it was masked in a typically British way by nonchalance. When Rommel was expected in Cairo that evening, Lord Killern, my ambassador, instantly gave a dinner for 80 people at the Muhammad Ali Club and said, well, when he comes down, he'll know where to find us. Past Mirza Matru, 
past Martin Bagouche, past Fouca, past Darbo. The British fell back until on June the 30th, 1942, they reached a railway halt just 60 miles from Alexandria, El Alamein. It was no chance choice of Auchinlex that the decisive battle for Egypt should be fought here at El Alamein. This bit of desert was not like any other over which the war had been fought these last two years. As always, the sea was to the north, but here, just 40 miles inland, was another sea. The sunken sea of quicksand and salt marsh. Impassable to tanks. The Katara Depression. Until now, the fluid strategy of desert warfare had sprung from there being always an open flank. But at Alamein, Rommel would have to think of something different. Orkinlek prepared for the final battle for Egypt, for after Tobruk, he had sacked Ritchie and taken command of the Eighth Army himself. But Churchill was already planning to sack him too. Rommel didn't wait for Churchill's decision. He threw his tired troops into a last desperate attempt to take Egypt. In July, in perhaps the most decisive battle of the Desert War, Orkinlek halted him. It was a frightfully important battle, and it was touch and go that we might have lost the whole of the Middle East base. Churchill went to see for himself in August the troops' morale. Tobruk's fall had exasperated him, but he was heartened by the reception he got from the 8th Army. He had already decided to appoint Alexander in place of Auchinleck. The new 8th Army commander was to be Montgomery, although Montgomery had not set foot in the desert during the war. When Montgomery came, we were a bit apprehensive about him because we'd never seen this man who had white knees and what have you. In the presence of your PM, suddenly, it was a very tonic thing. He was wearing a siren suit, smoking an immense cigar, but he had WC on his slippers. He was wearing those old-fashioned dancing pumps that you used to wear in those days with dinner jackets, with W on one foot and C on the other. And he gave us a very good pep talk. For Rommel, the laws of desert warfare now began to work against him. The further the advance, the longer the supply line. I think uh, we had crossed the Rubicon like Caesar when we went to Egypt. The eyes of Hitler were directed every day to the Russian front, the deciding front, and our role was not so important. He was content if we had no difficulties, but he was not able to guarantee that supplies came to North African ports. Only one in four of Rommel's supply ships ever got through. The solution, late in the day, crush Malta. Göring's Luftwaffe believed it could annihilate the island single-handed.
Chukas, Hankels, Junkers, Dorniers, Messerschmitts, day in, day out, hundreds at a time, were ordered against the island. Malta became the most bombed place on earth. Malta held out. Equally bad for Rommel, the Desert Air Force could now operate from its home bases along the Nile, just a hundred miles behind the line. In the desert, the fighting is characterized by the opposition of tanks large quantities of artillery, of air support. Air support, for instance, didn't play a considerable role in Russia, where troops had enough cover. In Africa, air superiority was all decisive. Montgomery had air superiority. Desperately short of fuel, Rommel's convoys had to run the gauntlet the 1,400 miles from its main base at Tripoli, whereas Montgomery was only 60 miles from his at Alexandria. The distance from the ports Benghazi, Tripolis, and perhaps Tobol had become too big. During the jigsaws up and down the desert, when we pushed Rommel back, we used to accuse him of putting oil in the wells, which we thought was really a dirty trick. And then when we came back down, he would blame us for putting oil in the water. And now it seems that all the time, it was the oil wells below the ground seeping through into the water well. In September, the morale of the Africa Corps was dealt a blow when Rommel fell ill. Hitler ordered him home. But his men were left behind under the desert sun for a second year. When you are in the desert, you feel like a man on the moon would feel. You are alone with the universe. For the men of the Africa Corps, far from home, there was no question of leave, only the certainty that sooner or later, the British would attack them. There was the homesickness of the soldier who would have preferred to be at home and not at war. It was perhaps no accident that the desert campaign produced the most memorable song of the Second World War. Lily Marlene was a piece of our home. Lily Malena became equally popular with the British. You were always in touch with home. We, we heard the news, and of course we heard the opposition's news, uh, witnessed underneath the lamppost by the barrack gate. For the British, home comforts were close at hand in Cairo, just the place for a spot of leave with its bars, bazaars, and um, other distractions. They used to take your money, yes. <laughs> say 75 percent of them if they could find another woman that have her it really was weird when you think of the whole of europe blacked out and in darkness despair you know 
Like in Cairo, seething with delight, you rang up uh, people, you went out to dinner, you had a hot bath and a whiskey, and so on, on Monday morning you'd be back in the line. Montgomery saw his main task as raising the troops' morale. He was the first British commander to project himself like an American politician. Pressmen, and particularly press photographers, kept at arm's length by Wavell and Auchinleck, now found themselves welcome. He Im immediately, as quickly as possible, started going around all the formations of the Eighth Army and gathering people around to talk to them. And he uh, used also the press, the radio, and gimmicks such as his hat. They wanted something to be able to identify themselves with and to, to look at. It's something other than the, the strict uniform. Really, it was remarkable. In three or four days, there was a completely different atmosphere in the Eighth Army, and there was a feeling of confidence. Uh, he told us that the bad old days were over, and he was now determined there was going to be success. He said, now the only order is everyone stays where they are, and fights where they are, and dies where they are. Montgomery saw to it that his army had the very latest weapons. Constantly pressed by Churchill to take the offensive, Monty, as he was soon known, was not going to be rushed. He was determined, as he put it, to have everyone tough and hard for the coming battle. Because its first few hours were going to be dominated by the mine, the Germans had laid well over half a million of them, the offensive was given the code name Operation Lightfoot. Sick joke, if ever there was one. An electronic mine detector had been devised for use at Alamein, but many were found to be faulty on arrival, and so most of the detecting had to be done in the old way, by men prodding the ground with bayonets and lifting the mines by hand. The German minefields at Alamein were five miles deep. To assault them, Montgomery had assembled a quarter of a million troops. British, Australians, New Zealanders, Indians, South Africans, Greeks, Poles, Czechs, and Free French. Twice as many men as Rommel had. Nothing was being left to chance. Oh, we were fully trained. We were really confident. Every single solitary man knew exactly what he had to do. Everything was in your favour. We had no fear of such. It's an old adage, you know, that it never happened to you personally, you think. October the 23rd, 1942. In the darkening desert, 1,100 tanks and 1,000 guns moved into position. I was with my battalion laying mines in front of our own positions. And the Battle of Alamein started by seeing the whole horizon on fire. Yeah, well, a lot of people think that Alamein was a big barrage and everybody waiting behind queuing up ready to go once the barrage finished. But it wasn't like that at all. There was some bloody fighting there, believe me. We moved off before the barrage. Uh, we were allowed a walk in pace. The artillery fell in front of us. In the morning, we were disappointed, to say the least, when the tanks should have passed us. They hadn't arrived. Nobody had arrived. By the time the sappers got the mines up and there was a road made, the Germans realised the reason and they pinpointed that opening. There was all the uncertainty that the ground was going to erupt underneath you. 
that you forget about running through the minefield when a shell suddenly drops this side of you or that side of you. Our machine gun fire opens up, our mortar fire. There were squeals, shouts. It was a battle of attrition. It was uh, fought in a way, and rightly in a way, in which uh, you had to continue the offensive until you had broken the enemy's power of resistance, and this does take time. If infantry gets on the objective, destroys the anti-tank gun, and the minefields are cleared, then the tank can come forward and exploit the situation. But until that happens, no success in the tanks. Montgomery lost 200 tanks in the first two days, as many as the Germans had started with. Rommel, now back in Africa, though clearly far from well, immediately counterattacked. Angry, his panzers had not done so when the British had been bogged down in the minefields. It was too late. Rommel was thrown back with losses he could ill afford. Casualties were heavy on both sides. They really hung on, see? It was really stubborn. When we finished, then we realised the casualties we'd left behind. You've kept saying to yourself, it won't happen to me, here, catch it. I won't. The law's on it dawned on us. One day, you won't always get away with it, lad. It was a killing match as Monty had predicted, a messy, horrid, killing match. A First World War battle fought with Second World War weapons. The Battle of Attrition was going Montgomery's way. The moment had come for him to let loose his armor. Eight hundred tanks, mostly Shermans, the latest and best tank from America, were thrown against the Germans and Italians. And Rommel had less than a hundred tanks. Again, the fighting was bitter. Rommel began to yield a little. Two days more, the battle raged. It was the biggest tank battle of the Desert War. Rommel was now down to only 35 tanks, compared with Montgomery's 600. But just when he was thinking of slipping away to hold a line 60 miles back, Hitler ordered him to stay. It's a particularly nasty form of ending one's days if one is trapped in a tank and the tank brews up and is on fire. You will never lose the awfulness of screams of men trying to get out. British armour was through, and by the afternoon of November the 4th, the 12th day of the battle, Rommel was in full retreat. Thousands of Italians were left behind. The Germans had pinched their transport. Rommel's deputy, Fontoma, was captured too. Alexander signaled Churchill to ring out the victory bells, which Winston did. The first time church bells had been rung in Britain since Dunkirk. Heavy rain fell on November the 6th to impede both pursued and pursuer. 
and Gamory's corps commanders were all for rushing ahead to trap Rommel before he could reorganize. But Monte was not going to risk being trapped himself. Montgomery was very conscious that we had already been twice up and twice back, and he was determined not to be pushed back for a third time. The Desert Air Force thought to it that Rommel's retreat was not without incident. He had nowhere to run, and all he could do was run into the sand. See, this is where the desert warfare was something on its own. You just sat out there, or you moved out there, and you were exposed to the ring. Past Mirza Matru, past Sidi Barani. Through Halfire Pass, Rommel was pushed back, turning to fight a little every day. On November the 13th, to Churchill's great joy, Tobruk was retaken. A week later, it was Benghazi's turn to change hands for the fifth and positively final time. Mid-January 1943, Tripoli fell. The prize that had eluded O'Connor two years before. At last, the British people had something really to cheer about. And Churchill, the big victory he'd been hoping for before America would dominate the war. have altered the face of the war in the most remarkable way. I must tell you that your fame, the fame of the Desert Army, has spread throughout the world. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning.